In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, in this morning's passage, we read about the calling of Jesus' first apostles, as recorded in Luke's Gospel. Uh, let's go to the fifth chapter. And early in the chapter of Luke's record, uh, he records the, the Annunciation of Birth of John the Baptist and Jesus. The angel Gabriel first visits Zechariah and tells him of the coming conception of John the Baptist, the feast which we celebrate today. And six months later, appears to Theotokos and announces the birth of Christ to her. John's birth was recorded by Luke, um, followed by our Savior's birth at Bethlehem. Uh, Luke then gives two of the three events that we know from Jesus' childhood. Uh, Matthew writes the first one, uh, and he tells us that in a dream, Joseph was told to take Jesus and Mary to Egypt to escape the slaughter of infants fetched by Herod, who sought to kill the young Messiah. And then in the same way, uh, there's a, Joseph has another dream, and he is called to return to Egypt, and the family settles in Nazareth in Galilee. Luke records uh, the presentation of Jesus in the temple and the prophetic words of Simeon and Anna. And then he tells us that Joseph, Mary, and Jesus celebrated uh, the Passover feast in Jerusalem a year ago. One year, when Jesus was 12 years old, he stayed behind with the rest of the relatives uh, returned to Nazareth. Mary and Joseph did not notice he was missing until the first day, and they returned to Jerusalem and spent three days searching for him. And they find him in the temple talking with uh, the Pharisees and the scribes. He was asking them questions and speaking with them, and they all marveled at his knowledge. His parents, of course, were anxious, but he told them that he had to be in his father's house. They returned home, and Luke tells us that he continued to be in subjection to them, uh, for the rest of his adolescent days. And he continued to grow both physically and spiritually and found favor in both, both the sight of men and God. The third chapter of Luke uh, records the forerunners preaching on repentance and the baptism of Jesus. And then Luke records Jesus' genealogy. Uh, Matthew also has a genealogy of Jesus. Um, Matthew go back, goes back to Abraham, while Luke traces Jesus' genealogy back to Adam. The fourth chapter of Luke begins with uh, Jesus having 40 days of temptation, temptation in the desert, after which he returns to Nazareth and begins teaching the people in the synagogue. He reads them out of the book of Isaiah. He tells them, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he then tells the people, that today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The people took a great offense and, uh, from, at this. They knew him as a child. He says he's the carpenter's son. How can he be telling us these things? And they sought to throw him off a hill. But Jesus passed in the midst of them, and he returns to Capernaum, which would be his main residence uh, throughout his ministry. In Capernaum, he regularly teaches in the, in the synagogues, casts out unclean spirits, and heals many sick. And they come, then we come to today's passage. So today's passage begins with Jesus teaching by the seashore. There is a large crowd gathered, and he sees two boats on the shore. The fishermen were cleaning their nets, preparing them for the next evening's work. So Jesus got into Simon Peter's boat and asked him to put out a little bit from out into the shore, and then he sits down and teaches the people. So Jesus knew Peter. In John's Gospel, uh, when John the Baptist first pointed out Christ as the Lamb of God, we are told the two disciples uh, followed Jesus. And one of them was Andrew, the first call. Andrew followed Jesus, he stayed with him and heard his teachings that day, and then went and found Peter and told Peter they had found the Messiah, and brings him to Jesus. When Jesus sees Peter, he says, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. And in Capernaum, Jesus may have stayed in Peter's home, for in the fourth chapter of Luke, we are told that he, he healed his mother-in-law. So he, he had a, an acquaintance with Peter and Andrew. So after teaching the people, Jesus tells Peter to go into deeper water, and to let down his net for a catch. Peter puts up a little bit of resistance. He was probably tired. He had fished all night, he had caught nothing. And if you let the nets down, you have to clean them once again, once they return to shore. He was a trained fisherman, and he knew that night was the best time to fish. But he had seen the miracles that Jesus had performed, and he knew that Jesus was no ordinary man. So he obeys Jesus, and goes out into deeper water, and lets down his nets. The text implies Almost immediately, the nets were filled with fish. It was such a huge catch that the nets began to break. Peter and Andrew have to signal to their partners, James and John, to bring the other boat to help them. <coughs> and they filled both boats with fish to the point that they were in danger of sinking. Peter immediately recognized that a miracle was taking place. 
And he falls at Jesus' feet and says, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Like many in the Old Testament before him, and many saints after him, Peter realized that he was in the presence of holiness and purity. Many of the spiritual writers testify that the closer they get to the Lord, the more their sinfulness is revealed to them. God's light shines and exposes the darkness in our souls. And this is what Peter was, was feeling at that moment. He recognized he was in the presence of the divine that caused him to see his own sinfulness. In his humility, he asked Jesus to depart from him, for he was not worthy to be in his presence. But Peter was a spokesman, because the text tells us the fishermen felt the same amazement at the miracle that they just experienced. But Jesus tells them, Do not fear, from now on you'll be catching men. The word used here for catching is actually the Greek word that means uh, catching live men. You know, you're, you're bringing people um, life, catching them and bringing them life. And Master, Matthew records Jesus' words as, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. So when they returned to the shore, they, ob they obeyed the Lord. They left everything, including the largest catch of fish they ever had, and followed the Lord as his first disciples. In last week's message, we spoke about humility. This week's gospel highlights obedience. We see two instances of obedience that Peter performs to the Lord. Uh, first was when they went back out after fishing all night and caught the miraculous catch of fish. And the second, when they left everything to follow the Lord. One of the desert wizards says, obedience is a higher virtue than chastity. However perfect chastity is, is performed. Because chastity has the danger of pride, but obedience has the promise of humility. Humility and obedience work closely together. Without humility, virtuous obedience is impossible. We can be obedient under compulsion, but virtuous obedience grows from desire to serve another out of love. The more we practice obedience, the deeper our humility grows. Practicing obedience means giving up our own will for another, and in doing this, humility grows. The Bible is full of examples of obedience. Moses obeyed the Lord constantly as he led his people out of Egypt and through the desert for 40 years. The prophets all obeyed the Lord in their, in their ministries. Hosea, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah all suffered scorn, ridicule, and Jeremiah especially physical uh, abuse in obeying the Lord's commands. Elijah's life was in constant danger of death because of his prophetic ministry. And then Abraham, the father of the Jewish race, had an amazing obedience. He first obeyed the Lord by leaving his family and country and traveling to a stage, strange country to live as a nomad. Pinnacle of his obedience was when the Lord asked him to sacrifice his own son, Isaac. Isaac was the child of promise. It was through him that the Lord promised to perpetuate Abraham's seed, his line. And he promised that his seed would be as numerous as the sands of the seashore. But then the Lord told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and Abraham obeyed. The book of Hebrews uh, describes this. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendant shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received Isaac back as a type. So Abraham did not understand what he was called to do. But in humility, he obeyed the Lord's command. And he trusted that if the Lord needed, he would even he would raise up his son, Isaac, to fill his promises. We may never have to obey the Lord in such a dramatic fashion. These Old Testament examples were given to us to teach us and to encourage us, to encourage us that when we obey the Lord, he is always at our side, that we can trust him and have complete, <coughs> complete knowledge that he wants the best for each one of us. We can all learn obedience just by, simply by living our lives. One writer wrote, a novice in a cloister cannot find more of an opportunity for obedience than you in your own home. Does your wife or your parent ask you to do something? Do it in obedience. If your neighbor needs help, do it in obedience. These small acts of obedience breaks down our self-will and our pride, and they increase our humility and our peace. As we habitually practice serving others out of love, we grow in living our Christian life and in our Christ-likeness. And as we continue to do these small things for the Lord, in obedience. We're prepared to obey him when he asks us to obey him in the challenging areas of our life. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind, always now and ever unto the ages of ages.